A light rain began to fall as we all gathered around the final resting place of a woman who meant something to each of us. I can't say exactly what it was, because it would be different in each case. Some of us had eyes full of hot, salty tears and hearts filled with sadness and grief at her passing. Others weren't really that concerned, but came to support a loved one who came. I was here because I had to, but on the other hand, I wanted to make sure this bitch wasn't pulling a stunt. I wanted to see her in that drawer, to see it at least closed, if not nailed down, so I could put an end to that aspect of my life. I also needed to be here for my children. I really don't believe my son or my daughters really care that much. Strange, but among all those present, we cried the least. We probably knew Heidi best. As I look at the moderately large group gathered around the open grave, I see some people meet my gaze and smile or wave. I feel their sympathy and respond with a smile to their expressed condolences. I also see others, mostly men but also a few women who are afraid to meet my gaze and sneak glances in any direction other than at me. I wish there was a way to let them know that my animosity towards them died with Heidi. I figured out how to do this literally at the last moment. A small tanned hand crept into mine and squeezed it tightly. I stood at the head of the meeting so everyone could see what I was doing. I knelt before the woman next to me, squeezing my hand to assure me of her love, and pressed my head against her bulging, almost eight months old pregnant belly. My daughter smiled, and there were surprised but happy whispers among the crowd. My simple gesture echoed in each of them, reminding everyone of the essence about the circle of life that we learned from that damn movie, The Lion King. When one leaves, another comes. I couldn't help but smile at myself. Everyone else here was smiling because they thought of death and new life as opposites. I smiled because I didn't realize it at the time, but Heidi would have hated it. She's probably already at the gates of hell, screaming for a chance to come back, because for the first time, I took all the attention away from her. This was supposed to be her day. This was to be her last performance here on this earthly plane, and now everyone is more interested in my child than in Heidi. I'm a mature adult. This child will be my fourth. As I said, I had three children while I was married to Heidi. The rest are already adults and are at peace. David's standing next to me. My daughter Sarah is on his other side, and my daughter Sasha is even further to the right. I'm almost 60 years old, so I've learned throughout my life that you have to let go of some things. By the time Heidi died, I no longer hated her or harbored resentment for making so much of my life a waste. As I looked at the three wonderful people she and I brought into the world, I knew I could never be truly mad at her, because I love them with all my heart and soul. I also knew that, without Heidi, they wouldn't be the same. So I let go of all my hatred and anger towards Heidi over three years ago. Hatred and anger poison a person's life. Heidi no longer plays a role in my life so there was simply no reason to allow any ill feelings toward her to color my existence. I still wanted to see her serve as food for a giant three-headed dog, slowly roasting for an eternity, but I didn't spend much time on it. The last time I saw Heidi alive was five months ago. We all gathered, or in my case were called, to a large family Thanksgiving dinner at my son David's house. I think about this day and the events that led up to it, as the minister begins his soothing words. It was sunset on an unexpectedly warm November evening in Florida. This day and night was almost summer. It was sunny and warm throughout the week, but not sweltering. A single figure walked purposefully along the beach. His shoulders were hunched, bearing the weight of tension. He was heading towards two beach chairs, which were the only element that disturbed the pristine beauty of nature on a stretch of private beach. The chairs were not arranged as one would expect, although they stood side by side and parallel, only a few inches apart, one was facing east and the other west. In one chair sat a gray-haired but still strong old man watching the waves. Sometimes he would get up and throw stones into the ocean. He also stares dreamily at a car in the driveway of a house just a few yards from the chair in which he sometimes sat. A woman was sitting in another chair. At 29, she was exactly half his age. Their birthdays were also one day apart. The man, me, had a steely gaze. Although my eyes had dimmed over time to the point where they appeared more gray than their former blue. 
The woman's soulful brown eyes and calm demeanor seemed the complete opposite of mine. Her large breasts and long legs surrounded her once flat stomach, which was just beginning to stand out if you looked closely. Her tanned skin was more from her Mexican heritage than from any amount of sun. Her long, rich brown hair was pulled back into a ponytail. She was as collected and still as I was, energetic and animated. Neither of us noticed the figure dragging its feet in anger across the sand as he walked towards us. James, we should rest, she said in impeccable English. We are resting, I said. We don't even do anything. No, expensive. I do nothing. You walk back and forth between the water and your chair. You throw every piece of wood, stone, and any other debris you find into the water, where the tide washes it back onto the beach. I get tired just looking at you. I sat back down in my chair, and it became clear why she had arranged the chairs that way. Being face to face, we could look each other straight in the eye from very close and kiss each other without moving too much. With her attention focused on me and the book she was reading on her iPad, she didn't see the man until it was too late. He, like me, was just under six feet. He was well built and probably 20 years younger than me. In fact, I knew for sure that he was exactly 20 years, three months, and 14 days younger than me. I was calculating the exact date when his fist darted towards me. It was fucking disgraceful to see some guy in his 30s trying to take down a guy who was almost legally retired. Wait for that thought. I had a second inconvenience because I was sitting while he was standing over me. I easily caught his flashing fist and hooked my leg into his knees, knocking him down onto the beach. I immediately rolled on top of him and began to wrestle with him. His rage and youth seemed to be balanced by my superior strength, energy, and experience. The battle, as is usually the case, was determined only by the endurance of the opponents. The sound of the metallic click and the words whispered through clenched teeth took all the fighting out of him. If you move, I'll shoot, Samantha said angrily, pressing the gun to his head. The sound of her pistol alone, a custom 450 automag, was intimidating. The man, my son David, whom I had not seen for three years, immediately froze. Samantha bit one of her attractive lips. David shuddered, seeing only death in her eyes. Samantha let out a string of curse words in perfect Spanish, and I started laughing. Sam, don't shoot him, I said. Besides cleaning up the beach and hiding the body, we'll just have to go to the funeral. And the funeral will probably be in Michigan. It's cold as hell right now. I wouldn't even want to take my Mustang there, let alone the three of us. She looked at me strangely. Dave, have you noticed that the more angry she gets, the stronger her accent? Before you showed up, she spoke perfect English. Once you got her angry, her Spanish accent became so strong it was crazy. At this rate, she will speak Aztec in a few minutes. Is this, is this David? She asked. Your son, David? I nodded and smiled. And you were going to shoot him. I still can, she said. But she pulled the gun away from his head. So, David, I said calmly. Why did you travel nearly 1,200 miles to attack me? And how did you find me? I had a very good private investigator. A lot of people say she's the best. She's a family friend of Uncle Chance and his girlfriend, he said. Her name is Sarah Price, I finished for him. She works for the Rios Agency, right? Immediately, Samantha began muttering to herself, turned around, and picked up her chair. She turned the chair so that it was next to mine, and then with obvious irritation, sat down in such a way that if the pregnancy had progressed, she might have thrown up on that lounge chair. She continued to swear, but switched to Spanish and began reading her book, or pretended to. Um, Dad, David asked. What's got her so upset? Rios is her uncle, I said. Sarah is one of her best friends. I guess they didn't know you were looking for me. I rarely use my full name here, so I doubt Sarah even put two and two together. So why did you come here? I asked again. Dad, it's hard at home, he began. And with Mom, it's not good. She's just not in her right mind. She hasn't been like this since you left. It's been one thing after another, and now she's been diagnosed with some mysterious illness. I'm not sure. 
Does mom know what it is and just won't tell us? Or do they really not know what it is? I shrugged. I also gave the best acting performance of my life. Both David and Samantha looked at me, each for their own reasons. I'm not a doctor, David, I said. I have a small but successful business here. Technically, I should be in early retirement, but I still need to work. Life is more expensive here than it was in Michigan. I need to work long enough to make sure that my wife and the child or children will be well provided for when I'm gone. You're not going anywhere, Sam countered quietly. I meant when I die, Miss Carrier of Smart Answers, I said. And I meant what I said, she chuckled. Even God knows you belong to me. He must keep his hands off you until I'm ready to let you go. David looked at us strangely. So I just don't see what I can do, I said, or how it applies to me. What about all that bullshit you taught us growing up? He said sharply. What about accepting your responsibilities and doing the right thing? He said even louder. I came here to talk to you about coming home so we could be a family again. I wanted you to come back to help mom with what she was going through. Neither of us have any idea why you just disappeared while mom was injured. You disappeared without a trace or any reason and left her without a livelihood. Samantha started swearing in Spanish again and I started laughing. So you really don't know? I laughed. I don't know what. He quit. That the man I looked up to most of my life and wanted to be like left his wife without a word to come to Miami and spend time with women younger than his children. Here you are, living in luxury, pretending to be married when your real wife is suffering and your children have to work harder to support her. What a bitch, I blurted out. What a bitch, Sam repeated. David stood up furious. Don't talk about my mother like that, he said. Before he was fully on his feet, Sam pointed her gun at him again. Damn you both, I said. Sam, put the gun away, and David, go inside the house. We need to talk. When we finish talking, you'll probably agree. You agree with me that your mom is a bitch. Bitch, Sam repeated. What if I don't agree, he asked. Then I'll go back to Michigan with you, I said. We walked through the house and out onto a small terrace at the back. Sam brought us beer. First of all, I began, who told you that I left your mother without funds? She herself, he said. In fact, she's been living with my wife and I since you left, and we've had to... I rolled on the floor laughing. Anger was written on his face and his eyes flashed. Dad, you don't take anything seriously, he screamed. Why are you angry at me? I asked. The apple didn't fall far from the tree, you know. I left him sitting on the terrace. I went to my office and brought a stack of papers. I gave them to him. What am I watching? He asked. You're looking at the sale file for the house we lived in, I said. When I left, I arranged for your mother to get the house. The house sold for a little over $400,000. The check was made out to her. Here's a photo of the canceled check. So what if I left her without funds, which she did to everyone with this money? She never, she said, he trailed off. Welcome to the club, I said. Your mother is the type of person who is always there when she needs it. With me gone, she needed someone else to take care of her. You stepped up. Of course, if you knew that she has almost half a million dollars, you would expect her to rent her place so she would have to be broke and homeless. I'm guessing that's why she told you she had no money. Dad, how did you get these papers? He asked. I had to provide for them because I gave her the house as part of our divorce. Are you divorced? He asked. Of course, I said. I couldn't have married Sam if I hadn't been divorced. But Mom said, he began, I filed for divorce. Your mother refused to sign the papers. She refused to come to meetings. She refused to come to court. They issued a warrant for her arrest. She ignored it, and most police officers would not serve a warrant on a 55-year-old woman. No one knew where she was. Now I know that she was hiding at your house. One of the reasons I moved here is because this is one of the states that allows divorces by default. You can file all the papers, and if the person with whom you want a divorce refuses to answer, time begins to run out. 
After a certain time, the divorce is carried out, whether they agree or not, because the court believes that both lives have continued separately long enough for both parties to accept it. I could give her nothing, but I still gave her the house. Dave got angry again. Dad, she didn't tell us anything, he said. Dave, your mom has always been like this. Everything always revolves around her. She needs to be the center of attention. Look at the rest of the file. What are these three envelopes? He asked. When I left, you and Kelly were still working in Alaska, I said. You were always on the road and I couldn't contact you. Your sisters were still in college and I didn't want to bother them. When I sent the divorce information to your mom, I also sent her these three envelopes for the three of you. Each contained a check for you and your sisters. When the envelopes were, they were lost, the checks were gone, but everything else remained untouched. How much were the checks for? He asked. $10,000 each, I said. David flew off my deck onto the grass below and kicked the tree in the middle of the yard as hard as he could. I just thought that you three decided that, rightly or wrongly, she was your mother and you supported her in the divorce. I just thought I was left alone. None of you ever called or texted me, I said. Not on my birthday, not on Christmas, not even on Father's Day. I just assumed you didn't want to hear from me. So you seem to have settled in pretty well, he said, looking around. And she's beautiful. Are you really married? Yes, I said. I've never met anyone like her. She's everything I hoped your mom would someday be. But Dad, she... How old is she? He asked, changing tactics. She just turned 29, I said. She's usually very nice, but she cares about me a lot. And besides, she's pregnant. It's a boy. So... I'll finally get the little brother I wanted, but I'll have to wait until I'm 38, he chuckled. And my new stepmom is almost 10 years younger than me. Hell, she's younger than Sarah and Sasha, too. How long have you two been together? Two years, Sam said as she walked out of the house with a tray containing beer and snacks. Damn, he shouted. Sorry, ma'am, I just... I feel like Keanu Reeves when he found out he lived his whole damn life in the Matrix. Half of me wishes I didn't come here. Every time you open your mouth, another, the lies mom told me, come out. She made me think you probably ran off with your secretary. When we met your former secretary, Carol Brady, we attacked her and demanded that she tell us where you were. Her name is Samantha or Sam, she said. Dad, I have no idea how to explain all this to Sarah and Sasha. They expected me to drag you to Michigan so that you would repent of your actions and be there for mom during her crisis, he said. Don't worry, I said. Don't tell them anything yet. But why, he asked. They deserve to know. I agree, I said. That's why I'm coming to your place for Thanksgiving dinner. We'll expose all the lies. Can you try to limit the guest list to just the five of us? Six, Sam said. Kelly makes seven. I can't have dinner at home without my wife. Justin will make eight, he said. Why the hell would Justin be there? I asked sharply. David was shocked because I had remained calm all this time. Even when he tried to hit me, I did not lose my composure. Dad? He was Sarah's boyfriend when you left. They're married now. He's not the son-in-law I'd want, but Sarah likes it, and that's all that matters, he said. I nodded my head. Okay, I said. Make sure old Justin is there too. Three days later, when I drove the Mustang into David's yard, I was already angry. It was cold and windy in Michigan. Samantha didn't like it. She lived in Florida all her life. She preferred the warm temperatures of the southern states. I bought her a nice new fur coat, and I was sure everyone would laugh at it. It was 45 degrees outside, and she was wrapped in a fur coat, as if she were going to the Arctic. The reason for my irritation was not the weather. Being a Michigan native, I knew what to expect. It was a car. I imagine being able to fully experience the Hertz Mustang GTH. Everyone knows the history of this car. In the 60s, Hertz asked Ford to build a fleet of special, high-performance Mustangs that they could lease to customers. People went crazy for them. A lot has happened. Some clients rented Mustangs and took them to drag races. Others have been caught renting cars and replacing high-performance engines with much more conventional ones before returning them. A couple of years after Ford introduced the retro-styled Mustang in 2005, 
they released a new version of the GTH. I figured I'd get one right after the plane. I knew the car wouldn't compare to my 2012 Boss 302, but I really wanted to be able to drive it. The Hertz office near Detroit Metro Airport was open, but they didn't have GTH models on their car list. The only Mustang they had was a V6 engine, and it was a damn convertible. I just knew from this omen that the trip was not going to be good. When Sam was shivering from what she perceived as the cold, I put my arm around her and we headed for the door. Before we even got to the porch, the door opened and a little ball of energy burst out of the house and rushed towards me. Being almost 60, it's a good thing I was in great shape because I had to fight to keep my balance. My daughter almost knocked me backwards down the concrete steps. I walked into David's house carrying Sarah, who stuck to me like a leech. All the way to the warm house, Sarah's feet never touched the ground. Sam stood and watched the scene with a smile on her face. As Sarah continued to hug and kiss me, my much more cynical daughter, Sasha, spoke up. Well done, Sarah, she said. I'm glad to see that you're still playing hard to get by forgiving him. I'm really sure your behavior is... We'll show him how wrong he was. Her sarcasm made me smile. Sarah stopped hugging me long enough to look over her shoulder at her sister and raise her middle finger. Fuck you. My dad is back, she said. At that moment, the two sisters looked around the room as David entered with his wife, Kelly. David smiled, then ignored me and immediately introduced Kelly to Samantha. Kelly seemed really interested in Sam's nearly five-foot fur coat. She nudged David in the side and pointed to the fur coat. Don't even start, he snapped. These things already cost a lot of money to begin with, and the more animals they have to kill, the more they cost. What do you mean, honey? Kelly asked, placing a hand on one of her generous thighs. Well, in Sam's case, they probably had to kill 20 or 30 minks to make that coat. I'd say it cost about four or 5,000. In your case, we'd have to take out a mortgage on the house, and this would bring minks to the brink of extinction. Sam's sharp intake of breath and her widened eyes made it clear how shocked she was by the way David spoke to Kelly. We're about the same size, Sam quickly lied. You could probably fit in this one. I like her, Kelly smiled. Honey, I couldn't possibly put my hand in that little fur coat. I know I'm a big girl, but trust me, Dave would never want it any other way. After the exchange between the two women, everyone in the room suddenly became interested in Sam. David approached her and pretended to search her for weapons. He then spread his arms and Sam walked up to him and hugged him. David led us into the living room, even though both my daughters were clearly interested in who and what Sam was. It was not surprising to see two of them sitting in the same room, although seeing Heidi sitting demurely on the couch with her feet up, while Justin sat on the other side of the room watching or pretending to watch a college football game, was not believable. Once we were all in the room, Kelly announced that she needed to check on the turkey and headed into the kitchen. She looked around to see if anyone was interested in joining her, and only Sam obliged. You stay here and get used to the house a little, honey, Kelly said. I expected one of these freeloaders to do it. Then I'll come by later, Sam said politely. Her nervousness made her accent stand out, and immediately every eye in the room turned to her, except David's and mine, of course. Hearing Sam speak, even my ex-wife looked away from me. Justin had his eyes glued to her from the moment she entered the room. He looked at her appraisingly from top to bottom. My ex looked at me with genuine fear in her eyes. I smiled at her and shook my head. Hi, Jim, she said. Will you hug me? This is a holiday. David even hugged his friend. She's not his friend, I said caustically. Besides, I heard that you were sick. If I hugged you the way I wanted, you probably wouldn't be able to breathe. You always hugged me like that, she said. You always got the best out of me, and I loved it. I always felt the best when you hugged me and let me know how much you loved me, she said without missing a beat. Yes, but now I would grab you by the throat and let you know something else, I said. I was hoping we could put the past behind us, Heidi said, sounding even more fragile than it had just moments before. I was sure that, like everything else about Heidi, the feigning of infirmity was an act. Dad, if Sam isn't David's friend, 
Who is she? Sarah asked. Even Justin looked up to hear the answer to this question. Unfortunately, he and everyone else had to wait for Kelly to reappear with a tray of beer. She handed me a chilled Dos Equis Amber. Then she also gave Justin a bottle of Dos Equis. She gave Sarah and Heidi glasses of what looked like white wine and a cup of tea for Sasha. She handed Dave a bottle of what appeared to be some kind of local homebrew. When she turned away from him, he reached out to spank her ass. She quickly moved away and turned to him. Uh-huh, she grinned. No loot for you. Hey, why can't I choose what I want to drink? Justin asked. You can, Kelly said sweetly. Once you get a job and pay for something, Justin, just pay for one thing. He looked at her angrily. Sam, what would you like to drink? Maybe white wine, or are you like me, a beer lover? She asked. I really can't drink alcohol, Sam said quietly. Are you afraid to do something unfeminine? Kelly asked. No, just pregnant, Sam smiled. This caused everyone in the room to turn and look at her again. I was sure Justin's mouth was drooling. The expressions on Sarah and Sasha's faces immediately changed. I have no idea why women are always more tolerant of other women when they're pregnant, but suddenly my daughters were in Sam's fan club without even knowing why she was there. This is great, said Sasha. Congratulations. Are you still in contact with your father? Very much so, Sam smiled. I love him like there's no tomorrow. Both girls cooed affectionately, even the cynical Sasha. Heidi pursed her lips a little tighter. So, Sam, Sarah said, if you're not my stupid brother's friend, are you his work colleague or something? Dave just smiled stupidly, not knowing what to say, so I helped. Sarah, honey, Sam and Dave have the same relationship as she has with you and Sasha. What is it? Justin, of all people, asked. He looked into my eyes and realized he shouldn't have said it and quickly looked away, but the question was there. She's his stepmother, I said, crossing the room and taking her coat. We sat down on the couch opposite the one Heidi was sitting on, and everyone in the room's jaws dropped. But Daddy, you can't marry her. You're still married to your mom, Sarah said. So, Heidi, you haven't told the kids that we're divorced? I asked. All eyes in the room turned to Heidi, who looked at me with evil intentions. It just didn't seem like the right time, she said with a mischievous smile on her face. I didn't want to upset them with the news that our family would probably fall apart. That makes sense, I said. Is that why you didn't tell them you stole their money? What is she? exclaimed Sasha. I, I, I wanted to hold on to their money until they were responsible enough to manage it. Heidi hesitated. Everyone in the room who is under 30, raise your hand, I said. The only hand that went up was Sam's. Oh, James, how old is this girl? I can't believe you got a woman younger than your daughter's pregnant, Heidi said. The hell with it, Sasha said sharply. We'll come back to this later. Let's talk about money and divorce. Heidi started coughing. I think I need to take some medicine, she said, trying to get up. It looks like you're trying to leave the room to avoid taking your medicine, I said mockingly. Heidi sat back down and crossed her arms over her chest. Okay, she said angrily. Your father ran away for no reason while I was in the hospital. No explanation, no reason, he just left. A few weeks later, I received a package from a courier. Inside were divorce papers. I refused to sign them. I refused to even acknowledge them. Your father and I will be married forever. We have always been together and always will be. He also sent a letter to each of you. They included contact information in case you wanted to contact him and a check for each of you. I thought that if I hadn't given you the letters, your father wouldn't have heard from you and should have returned home. I knew that even if he was angry with me, he would not be able to go far from his children. I can believe it. It almost makes sense except for one thing, I said. The checks were cashed and deposited into one of your accounts, so essentially, you stole their money. I'm sorry, Heidi whined. I'm an old woman. I'm alone. I thought I might need money in case of an emergency. If they never knew about money, they would never feel the lack of it. How much money was in the checks? Sarah asked. Ten thousand dollars each, Heidi said. Ten thousand damn dollars, 
Sasha screamed. She looked at her mother as if she wanted to strangle her. Kelly entered the room to find out what was causing the screaming. He left me penniless and alone, baby, Heidi said, reaching out to Sasha to calm her down. I just smiled, shook my head, and started laughing. What's so funny, Dad? Sasha asked. Your mother just can't stop lying, I said. Maybe it just slipped her mind. What went over her head? Sasha hissed. Home, I said casually. Let's get back to the money, Dad, Sasha said. I could already go back to school for my MBA. This money could make a big difference in my life. I could already be in my position as my Alnika right now. But I sit here and listen to how my father, who for the last three years I thought was the son of Satan, actually never left me. And that my mother essentially deceived me. Sorry, honey, I said. I loved your mother like no one else in the world. As angry and hurt as I was, I would never have left her with nothing. Before I left, I arranged the sale of the house and left her all the money. Dad, we already know about this, Sarah said. Mom told us the house was badly damaged and the mortgage was untenable. After paying taxes and the realtor, she received less than $5,000 and most of it went to her medical bills. I just shook my head and smiled. There were no medical bills, I said. Your mom left the hospital and was placed in a support facility because, after treatment, they thought I would have a hard time managing some of the things she needed every day. Most of her needs couldn't be met at home, and that was paid for too. And she got a little more money for the house than she told you, I continued. Um, can we talk about this after dinner? Kelly interrupted. Honey, you're going to want to hear this, David said. I saw the canceled check. How much did you get for the house, Mom? A little over $400,000, Heidi said quietly. But I was going to... How much did you get? Kelly asked. Why the hell are you at my house? We decided not to have a baby because you put your ass in our guest room. We don't charge you rent. You don't help and we serve you like we're carrying you. We're really tight on money. I couldn't get a job because we needed someone to look after you. And all this time you're sitting on a ton of money. By then... Kelly was looming over Heidi menacingly. Sasha and Sarah were right next to her. Maybe we'll wait until dinner is over to continue this, I said, smiling. A few minutes later, we all gathered at the table. It was like a scene from one of those 50s-era holiday movies. The snow was falling outside, and I knew that meant I would probably have to leave even earlier than we had planned to get to the airport. The Mustang will be fun to drive in the snow, my boss, 302, has not only never seen snow, it has never even heard of it. Hell, I haven't even driven it in the rain. The fact that the rental car was a V6 didn't mean anything. She still developed over 300 horsepower. When the eight of us entered the dining room, only three of us were not angry. Justin kept talking about how hungry he was, and Sam and I weren't used to going so long without kissing. I grabbed her and kissed her as we walked to the table. You'll sit at the head of the table, Dad, Kelly said. I sat down at the table, and suddenly a problem arose. Both Sam and Heidi tried to sit in the seat to my left. Mom, why don't you sit on the other side, suggested Kelly, who clearly didn't want any trouble at her table. You'll still be there for Daddy. The left side is the side with the heart line, Heidi answered sharply. I have to sit there because I'm the woman he loved most of his life. I always sit next to him, and I will sit as long as we both live, Sam said quietly. It seems funny that just a few minutes ago you were coughing and could barely stand, but now you're standing here fighting me for a chair. Everyone looked at Heidi, who smiled again and started coughing violently. I guess I don't know my strength, she said. She walked around the table, leaning on it as if she could barely stand. She reached her place and looked at me. Can you help me sit up, honey? She asked. Sam grumbled when Heidi called me darling. Of course, I said, pointing to the chair next to me. Here's your place. Really, Mom? Sasha sighed. I know you think we're stupid, but we're not that stupid. Here you go, Mom, David said. He walked up to her and pretended to hand her something. Everyone looked at him strangely. I should have given her an Oscar for that performance, he laughed. Everyone sat down. Sam sat to my left, holding my hand as always. Heidi sat down to my right. Sarah was next to Sam, 
and Sasha was next to her. David sat at the other end of the table with his wife, Kelly, to his left. Justin sat next to Kelly, across from Sarah, with Heidi to his left. As I looked around the table, I shook my head. What's wrong, Dad? Kelly asked. We'll talk about this later, I said. The thought in my head was that every man here was sitting with his beloved woman on the left. Poor Sarah. Okay, guys, I said. Stand up. Everyone stood up except Heidi, who struggled to her feet. Sasha rolled her eyes at her mother's whims. I asked God to bless the table and most of the people around it and thanked him for bringing most of us back together. I thanked Dev for providing all the food we were going to eat and for bringing us all together. I thanked Kelly for preparing the meal and for making their home a cozy place for us to meet, also for making my son happy and becoming another daughter to me. I thanked both of my daughters for becoming such beautiful young women and for allowing me back into their hearts and lives. I hinted to Sasha that she needed to pull herself together and give me a fucking grandson. Dad, Sarah is married. She laughed. I snorted and continued. Finally, I thanked Sam, the love of my life, for filling my life and my heart with love and making me realize that I still have the capacity to love. Then I sat down. What about Justin, Dad? Sarah asked. I never got a chance to tell you that we got married. I just rolled my ease and snorted. Justin's face fell. Sarah didn't say anything, but she looked at me and then back at Justin. What about me, honey? Heidi asked. Kelly lowered her head and shook it. I think everyone knew what would happen next. I turned to my ex and smiled. Heidi, you make me grateful that I left Michigan and found a better life. The bitch, however, was invulnerable. She answered quickly, and it cost her. As far as I remember, she began, for most of our lives we had fun like crazy, and our three children will testify to that. That was all she had time to say. Sam stood up and pushed back her chair. She then walked around the table before anyone could object. I still remember the sound of her heels clicking on the ceramic tiles of the floor. I think we all expected Sam to yell at her. I even wondered what she would say. Sam pulled her small fist back and hit Heidi like a piston in the mouth. It was a great shot. Heidi's head snapped back and she fell out of her chair, sprawling on the floor. Sam was beside herself. Justin pulled Sam away from Heidi, grabbing her large breasts from behind. And even when she didn't try to return to Heidi, he continued to squeeze them. He didn't so much pull her away as take advantage of the moment. I do not think so. I was just reacting. I grabbed the bowl of mashed potatoes and hit him in the face with it. He retreated, coughing and spitting out the creamy white food. What he did did not go unnoticed by Sarah. She grabbed the gravy boat and threw it at her husband's head. You damn bastard! She shouted. Get some sauce for your potatoes! The gravy boat hit Justin's head with a loud crash. He also doused his face and upper body with thick brown sauce. It's not Thanksgiving without cranberry sauce! Sasha said, dumping a bowl of canned cranberries on Justin's head. Stop, stop, Kelly screamed. Justin wiped his eyes and reached for the turkey. Luckily, David was faster. He grabbed the turkey to save it from the chaos and snatched it from the table. Unfortunately, the turkey was heavy and the floor was slippery from the cranberry sauce and greasy gravy. David lost his balance and the turkey flew up into Justin's face. Sam was so mad at Heidi that she didn't even notice what Justin was trying to do. She suddenly came to her senses and turned to see him on the floor. Heidi took this opportunity for revenge. Only Kelly's frightened scream saved Sam and our child. Heidi stood up surprisingly quickly for a sick woman. Kelly saw her and screamed, No! As usual, in an emergency, my first thought was about Sam. I knocked my ex-wife off her feet slamming her down onto the hard tile just as her foot was about to make its impact. Enough is enough. Just enough, David shouted. Dad, this crossed all boundaries. You've gone too far, he said angrily. You've crossed the line. No, he hasn't moved on, Kelly said, looking at the destruction left from the Thanksgiving dinner she'd been working on for nearly a week. Kelly, he forcefully knocked over a nearly 60-year-old sick woman. There is no excuse for this. No amount of hatred or revenge can justify this. 
Dave, he didn't do it out of hatred, Kelly said. He did it out of love. Your mother was going to kick a pregnant woman in the stomach. Dave opened his mouth in surprise. He looked at me and I nodded. If Kelly hadn't screamed, I said, if that blow had hit home, I would have strangled your mother to death and gladly gone to jail. Kelly probably saved at least two lives. Are you crazy, James? Heidi screamed. I am your wife, your soulmate. I am the mother of your ungrateful, greedy children. You swept me off my feet over some girl you've only known for 15 minutes. I grabbed Sam and pulled her into my lap. The hell with it, Dave said angrily. I need to know, where is all this hatred coming from? What started all this? Everyone goes to the living room. I need to hear it. We need to clean this up, Kelly began. No, we need to know what the hell happened, David shouted. I told you, Heidi began from the floor. Mom, shut up, said the usually cheerful Sarah. We've all heard your side of the story. I want to hear the truth. Um, sorry, but I have to go to work, Justin said. Sarah will tell me about it later. Sit down, your seat is Justin, I said. Justin, it's hard to go to work when you don't have a job, David said. Sit down and shut up. We all went into the living room. David lit the fire and we gathered around it. I fell in love with your mother at first sight, I began. It was 1973. I was 19 years old and we were both students at Central Michigan University. I was standing outside one of the buildings on campus and I saw this woman walk by. She was about 5'1", tall, with short blonde hair. They were cut kind of like a bob, and her eyes were so blue they made the sky look gray. Hold on tight, Sam said. Anyway, I crashed into a lamppost and almost knocked myself out, I continued. Because of her? Sam asked. I'm definitely going to puke. What did Mommy do? Sarah asked. She didn't even notice me or what happened to me, I said. Many people came and checked on me. Some helped me up. Others helped me collect my books and papers that were scattered everywhere. But your mother didn't even notice me. I later found out that she had come to meet the tutor to help her write a paper for her English class and she was more than half an hour late. The man left. As she turned to go back to her dorm, she walked past me again. And that's when you met, Sasha said. Can I tell the damn story myself? I asked. Nobody said anything, so I continued. No, we didn't meet. I was picking up the last of my papers, and she stepped on my hand. Anyway, it was three days later when we met. I was obsessed with her from the moment I first saw her. She had that look that was extremely popular back then. She was skinny and had that androgynous David Bowie look. I noticed that Samantha raised her hand. Honey, this isn't school. If you have a question, just ask it, I said. What is androgynous appearance? She asked. This look is neither masculine nor feminine. She was thin with almost no breasts and butt. Many famous models looked the same. They were all very thin with thin legs. So you liked girls who looked like boys? She asked. Everyone was like that, I said. It was a different era. Women are still trying to be thin. You're lying, she said. Men like women who look like women. In fact, it was my butt and breasts that you saw first before you noticed my face. Sam, honey, can I finish? She smiled and nodded. Anyway, I walked out of my English class and there she was standing. She had glitter in her hair and six-inch platform shoes. I was excited to see her there. I was trying to walk past to get to the next lecture and she moved away from me. Hey, I need to talk to you, she said. Don't worry, I said. Apology accepted. What the hell are you talking about? She asked. What should I apologize for? Because of what happened the other day. I saw you walking by and I got so distracted that I crashed into a pole, I said. Boy, that's your problem. A lot of guys get into stuff because of me, she said. My fantasy was quickly fading. On the way back, you stepped on my hand, I tried again. Why was your hand on the ground, she asked. Listen, I need you to write a paper for me. Okay, I said. I need you to go on a date with me. She started laughing as if it was the funniest thing she had ever heard. I was embarrassed and angry. I started to leave. She limped behind me. It was really difficult to walk quickly in those shoes. 
Okay, okay, it's an emergency, she said. We'll go on one date for work that will be graded at least a B. Agreed, I said. When do you need it? Tomorrow, she said. Twenty-five pages, single spacid, on any topic you choose. I need at least five footnotes and three citations. She gave me her phone number so I could call her when the job was ready. In those days, that meant her dorm phone number. Nobody had a cell phone back then. I was struggling to come up with something and I had a couple great ideas, but I ran out of time. So I did the next best thing. I gave her my coursework. My coursework wasn't needed for another week. I called her the next morning and she gave me her address so I could deliver the work. When I came with it, she took it and said, thank you. Then she started walking away. Hey, wait, I shouted after her. What about our date? She came back to me smiling. She placed my neatly typed pages on the table by the door and walked out onto the porch with me. There were no word processors or printers in those days. I had to manually type the pages on a typewriter. It was a hell of an experience. Listen, boy, she said. Did you really think I was serious? I have all my evenings planned for the next three months. But you know what? The point of dating is to get a girl to notice you so you can see if you're right for each other, right? Probably, I replied. So, she continued, I date a lot of guys. I almost never remember them, but I noticed you. It must be worth a lot. Next time I see you, I'll even nod. Many girls will agree to date you just because I nodded to you. She then returned to her building and grabbed the papers. I fell silent because all my children were looking at me and at Heidi. What a bitch, David said. Dad, you were a coward, Sarah said. Everyone on campus thought Heidi was going to be a famous model, I said. The modeling business was just beginning to gain momentum. The money they received then was pennies compared to today. But then it was very good. It was two or three months after Heidi approached me on campus. Hi, James, she said. Three months have passed. Today is your evening. Today is my evening of what? I asked. Your evening will take me out into the world, she said. What do you mean? I asked. Since I last spoke to Heidi, I have learned a lot about her. We didn't look at Facebook in those days. There was actually no internet. People learned about people by talking to those who knew them. And I learned that Heidi has quite a controversial reputation. She was also known for taking advantage of people. Everyone I knew and trusted told me to forget about her and find someone else. Besides, I already had plans for that evening. Heidi convinced me to change them in just six seconds. I was planning to go to the Kiss concert at Olympia Stadium. I had an extra ticket, but I kind of promised it to my best friend. Heidi took my hand and looked straight into my soul. My best friend was crossed out. Heidi got a ticket. So what time are we meeting? She asked. At six, I said. The concert starts at 7.30. They're opening for a local band called The Rockets. What are you talking about, Jimbo? She asked. I'm taking you to a concert. Kiss, I announced proudly. She immediately burst out laughing. Are you crazy? She laughed. Why should we go and look at a bunch of people who wear more makeup than me, yell at each other, and pretend to be monsters? It's not even music, it's just screams and noise. We can get to know each other as adults. I'll meet you at your dorm at ten. Don't forget the wine. That was my dilemma. Should I go to my favorite band's concert with my friends? Should I be there in the stands with thousands of like-minded people and have a great time? Or should I give up my tickets to spend the evening doing who knows? What with this crazy woman... I think this was my Morpheus moment. It was that moment when the hand of fate asks whether you want the blue pill or the red pill. I think everyone knows which one I chose. If I had done the smart thing and returned to the Matrix, I wouldn't be sitting here with you now. I chose the path down the rabbit hole, and here's the rest of the story from Paul Harvey. I met Heidi at the hostel at 10 o'clock. She was there right on time, which should have told me something. Heidi was never on time. That night I was nervous as hell. This was the first time I drank alcohol. It was some cheap, fruity, disgusting wine. I felt sick. She still didn't leave. I began to change my mind about Heidi. She stayed with me. What an idiot I was. I even asked her why she stayed. I'm your girlfriend now, she told me. Where is my sub? 
I didn't understand what she was talking about, but I continued to kiss her. I loved the feel of her lips on mine. She unbuttoned her blouse and placed my hand on her chest. Your mother, even today, does not have breasts. She got implants in the 90s, but then they had to be removed. When she was 20, there was nothing there. Kissing her gave me more pleasure than touching her breasts. But I did it anyway, because she liked it. Anyway, we had sex and I felt in seventh heaven. I felt alive for the first time. I felt like a man. I wanted to walk differently and talk differently. I thought I had discovered the secrets of the universe. I felt like Neo in that moment when he saves Morpheus and begins to believe that it is him. God, I'm so stupid. Anyway, she gave me another kiss and slipped out of my dorm. Anyway, the next day I started with a rainbow under my feet and sunshine pouring out of me and ended up on pins and needles, begging for a chance to survive. Heidi called me in tears early this morning. You're an asshole, she screamed. I trusted you. I said I'm your girlfriend. Then she hung up. I had no idea what was going on. As usual, when I was upset, I sat down and thought it through. I came to the conclusion that Heidi was angry because all my friends found out about our sex. There was nothing I could do about it. I called her and tried to apologize, but since I didn't actually tell anyone, I didn't feel guilty. She was the one who screamed all the time. She hung up as soon as she heard my voice. I should have sensed a catch, but once again I was the guy who embodied the Naya in the word naive. A few minutes later she called back in tears and sobbing into the phone. I'm sorry, Heidi, I whined, but I swear I didn't tell anyone. They heard you. I don't care who knows we did it, you idiot, she said. I'm your girlfriend. We had to do it. Then what are you upset about? I asked. You... you got me pregnant, she cried and burst into tears again. My world started falling apart as soon as she said that. All my dreams of becoming an engineer and designing better car engines went up in smoke. I was stunned. I didn't say a word. I just sat there holding the phone. This was the 70s, of course. Uh. So there was still a bit of that crazy 60s austerity. By the end of the decade, it no longer mattered. But back then, it was still big news when a young, unmarried woman became pregnant and was trying to raise a child. What do we do? I asked. We only have two choices, fool, she said. Either we get married or you find money for an abortion. We'll go to the doctor and find out how much it will cost. My mom will take us there. Okay, I said. What are we going to decide for? I would prefer an abortion, she said. I'm going to become a model. I don't want my body to deteriorate, and I'm not sure if I'm mother material. I love you, James, but I'm not sure I want to get married yet. When are we going? I asked. I should have sensed the trap. We'll pick you up in 15 minutes, she said. When I first met Heidi's mother, I then realized that Heidi was a mutant. She is so different from both her parents that it is a crime. I'm sure her father would have requested a paternity test if they had been available back then. Her mom was chubby with big breasts and the sweetest woman you'd ever meet. Of course, the first time we met, well, she didn't really like me. We drove to the doctor's office and we all sat together in the waiting room while Heidi's mother gave me icy looks. I brought her coffee and magazines and politely answered all her questions about my future and my readiness to marry Heidi. Heidi, of course, kept saying that she wanted an abortion and that I would pay for it. But her mother smiled and told me that if Heidi had to get married, she would prefer that she marry me and not those losers she dated before me. Besides, she thought that maybe I could calm Heidi down. So when we went to the doctor after they did Heidi's test, I was her brother-in-law. We even talked about how much help she could give us until I got my degree. She wanted me to become a successful engineer so I could take care of Heidi and her grandson. When the doctor came in, he was looking at a pile of papers. How many days are you late for your period, Heidi? He asked. Three weeks, she answered quietly. I took a home test and it came back positive, so I knew I was pregnant. Heidi's mom jumped up and hit her. 
The doctor was stunned. I sat there in shock. I didn't understand why Heidi's mom was so angry. She told me to leave the office, so I left. There was only screaming and shouting in the office. And when they left, Heidi apologized to me. The doctor must have told his nurses because everyone in the room was either smiling and nodding at me or looking at me like I had just fallen off a turnip truck. On the way home, I asked Heidi's mother what all the screaming was about. I still didn't know. Heidi and I were in the back seat. I held her hand and her mom turned around and looked at us. None of us had seat belts and mom had a cigarette sticking out of one side of her mouth. We were driving down the highway in a car without airbags and she was looking into the back seat. Hell, we could all die. I don't think she ever looked at the road. She simply drove until someone signaled to her and then she jerked the steering wheel sharply. Jimmy, my daughter tried to do a very bad thing to you, her mother said. You see, she thought she was pregnant about three weeks ago because she took one of those home pregnancy tests. They are not very accurate. The test showed that she was pregnant. Even if she were pregnant, it would unlikely be from you. You and Heidi had sex for the first time last night, right? I nodded. Honey, you can't get pregnant overnight, she said. Heidi tried to dump someone else's baby on you. You're a good guy. Most of the scoundrels she hangs out with aren't like that. She was counting on you to pay for the abortion, and if that wasn't possible, you would marry her and take care of the baby so she could continue to live in Disneyland. I frowned, and tears came to my eyes. I was still holding Heidi's hand, and her mom turned around and asked me why I was crying. You dodged a bullet, baby, she said. You should be happy. Why are you upset? I love her, I said. I really wanted to marry her. She stopped the car and all three of us cried together. Of course, none of us cried over the same things, but it was good to go through it and let it all out. You're the nicest young man I've ever met, Heidi's mom said as she drove away. For the next few weeks, I focused on school and activities. I was hit on by a lot of girls after rumors spread about my adventure with Heidi. But although I was wanted, I was not met. None of us can control or dictate who we fall in love with. There were some really nice and really good-looking women trying to date me, but I was still carrying the torch for Heidi. From the moment she left, I never heard from Heidi again. If we saw each other on the other side of campus, she would look the other way. If I tried to catch up with her, she just ran. I was heartbroken. My dorm classmates followed all the gossip on campus and had no problem telling me everything they could about her. They seemed to take special pleasure in telling me unpleasant things. However, Two months after the ill-fated visit to the doctor, I almost got over it. I finally gave in and agreed to go on a date with a really cute girl from one of my classes. She wore glasses, but was very cute. I was most interested in her personality, but I have to admit that she had the best parts of bigger girls, and I couldn't wait to have them. We went to the movies and walked back to her dorm, hand in hand. She smiled at me and we stopped and she put her hands on my shoulders and tilted her head back. In those days, it was a signal that she wanted me to kiss her. I chewed gum all day to make sure my breath was minty fresh. I leaned over and okay, I took a peek. I didn't do this. I didn't do it on purpose, but I wanted to make sure the kiss was perfect so she would want more. Her lips were big and soft, and I already had my arms around her waist. The kiss never achieved its goal. It was as if the hand of fate decided to intervene, just before our lips touched, I heard the worst squeal I've ever heard. What the hell are you doing? Heidi shouted. Why is my boyfriend kissing fat girls in the middle of the street? Is this some kind of research? Is this some kind of charity? Damn it, James. I told you you couldn't save the world alone. Isn't it enough that you donate money to feed starving children in Africa? Do you also have to kiss fat girls? You can't do it all. What do you want, Heidi? I asked. You're a fool, she snapped. I'm your girlfriend, remember? Don't act like you don't know how it works. Heidi, I haven't seen or heard from you in eight weeks, I said. When I met you on campus, you ran the other way. It was hormones, James, she said. And it's your fault. Heidi, you're crazy, I said. Yes, so what, she smiled. This is not your fault, but it's about hormones. I'm eight weeks pregnant, and this time it's for real. I've already been to the doctor, so guess who the dad is? I don't know, I said. It could be anyone. 
No, Jimmy James. You're the father, she squealed. I was tired of being a sucker, so I asked for a blood test. I also wanted to see a doctor. I talked to him, Heidi and her mom. They didn't do that in those days. All the dominoes were stacked and the timing was perfect. I was probably the only person who could have been the father. No abortions, I said. Okay, she said. But I want a ring. I want everyone to know that I belong to the father of my child. And I want us to get married before the baby is born. We'll get married the day the baby is born, I said. That way they can do a blood test just to make sure. So we got married, and we, or mostly I, had Dave. Dave was at daycare for the day so Heidi could go and work on her modeling career. Apparently she wasn't exactly the type they were looking for. There was always something wrong. Either she didn't have breasts, or they were too small, or they were too roomy, or they weren't roomy enough. I didn't care if she didn't make a penny as a model. I just need her to be happy. I worked all day. I dropped Dave off at daycare, picked him up in the evening, and then cared for him most of the night. I even cooked because Heidi was on her feet all day, making appointment after appointment, trying to catch up with her big break. But Dad, she got it in the end, didn't she? Asked my daughter Sarah. In her living room in her old house, she has huge blown-up photographs of her from the times when she was on the cover of Vogue and another magazine. Sarah, honey, it was fake, I said. If you look at this cover, it doesn't say Vogue, it says Vague. I made them up to cheer your mom up towards the end of her career. I was worried about Heidi because her ego was very fragile and modeling was hard. Imagine stomping from meeting to meeting all day and constantly hearing all day long, you are not what we want. I think somewhere along the way Heidi became disillusioned. She didn't go to meetings with the same enthusiasm she started with. I really think it's because times have changed and the disparate looks that were so popular in the late 70s have become ultra-conservative. I decided to surprise Heidi while she was at the agency she worked for by coming and bringing her flowers and inviting her to lunch. I just got promoted to team leader, and it brought more money and more respect. I wanted to spend money on my girlfriend and son. Everything was right in my world. I've heard Heidi talk about Phil Jackson since she started modeling. He was a famous photographer thanks to whom many models began to work. She told me that he thought she had the potential to become a supermodel. I walked into the agency and the woman at the desk told me that Heidi was in Phil's office taking some pictures for her portfolio. I was very excited. I will see my beloved at work. The charge evaporated when I burst into the agency and saw Heidi on her knees in front of Phil. It was surreal. Heidi stood up and started moving towards me and I noticed that she was completely naked. Obviously, Phil was going to have sex with her next. I looked around and picked up a pair of expensive-looking cameras. Phil tried to wave at me to put the cameras back. Please don't do this, he begged. I threw them as hard as I could onto the floor of his office. I also knocked over a shelf with about eight other cameras. I walked out of his office and heard Heidi running after me, trying to get dressed as she ran. People laughed at her when she followed me down the street barefoot. I was driving an old 71 Mustang at the time. I didn't like the Mustangs of the late 70s. I didn't care about the gasoline crisis or the environment. I wanted power. I decided if I could afford gas, and I could because I had a great job, then I could drive anything. Hell, all the previous generations have ruined the environment, so I deserve my chance to do it. When I got home... I put Dave to bed and called Heidi's mom to come and pick her up. She arrived before Heidi returned. I told her what Heidi did, and she just sat there and shook her head. While we were waiting for Heidi to come home, she must have smoked two packs of cigarettes. I still remember her holding her grandson and blowing smoke through the room like a chimney. It's amazing that we survived the 80s. When Heidi finally arrived, I took Dave and went out into the backyard so Heidi and her mother could have some alone time. She kept begging me to talk to her while her mother pulled her away from me. She told Heidi that I didn't want to talk to her and she needed to give me space. She took Heidi home. And the phone calls began. Heidi must have called home hundreds of times over the next 24 hours. After a few days, I agreed to let Heidi come visit Dave over the weekend. I planned to go shopping and maybe play golf while she was with him. When Heidi arrived and I was about to leave, she asked me where I was going. I said, 
and she reminded me that I usually took care of Dave, so she didn't know anything about feeding him, or changing him, or anything else. I was supposed to stay with them while she visited him. Heidi kept telling me how sorry she was, and how much she missed me. She told me that Phil made her do what she did, and that she had to do it, or he wouldn't be the photographer who edited her. Of course I got angry. She told me not to cause problems because it was just one of the tests on the way to top model status. Years later, I found out that she was lying then. Heidi harassed most of the photographers and many of the booking agents, trying to get a chance. But then I believed her. She seemed very sincere, and I loved her so much. She even suggested giving up her career and becoming a housewife. What could I say? We became close again, and I promised never to mention it again. The next few years were very good. I seemed to be making more and more money. And by the time Dave was five, Heidi was pregnant again. Sasha was born into a family that worshipped her. Heidi cheated on me again with Dave's third grade teacher, and I forgave her. We had a few more good years, and Sarah was born. I caught Heidi cheating with our housemate, but I couldn't leave because we had three children who I loved more than anything in the world. I wanted to leave her so bad, but I couldn't leave you guys. I thought it would be easier. As soon as you guys are old enough to leave home, I can too. I no longer felt the same way about Heidi. She had hurt me too many times. But we had been through so much together that it seemed easier to stay together than to start all over again. When Heidi's mother died, she seemed to calm down. We had the strangest conversation. Everyone left the funeral home, and only Heidi and I were left. Her mother was buried with a cigarette in her hand. I kept waiting for her to rise from the coffin and help us with our problem. Heidi looked at me through the coffin and began to speak. James, I'm terrible, she said. I spent most of my life waiting for lightning to strike so everyone would know I was special. I've cheated on you and our children more times than you know. For every time you caught me, there were five or six that you didn't know about. And I don't know why I do this. You have always been the best lover I have ever had. I was a lousy mother and a lousy wife, but you were still there for me through it all. Why? Because I loved you from the first moment I saw you, Heidi, I told her. James, I loved you too, from the moment you told my mom in the back seat of that damn coffin on wheels, when you told her, after I tried to set you up to play daddy for someone else's child, that you loved me and wanted to marry me, I fell in love with you. I tried to stay away from you because I thought you were too good for me and I didn't want to ruin you. But fate intervened and brought us together again. And now, for the last 25 years, I have been trying to ruin everything. A tear rolled down her cheek and I saw that she was serious. James, I will never cheat on you again. From now on, you are my only man. I promise, said but she. And I believed her. She melted my heart, and I didn't leave her like I planned. We've had some good years. We planned an early retirement for me, so Heidi and I could travel the world. We raised three wonderful children and began taking short trips to explore new things. Even though we were both over 50 and had been together for over 30 years, we acted like teenagers. It wasn't unusual for people to catch us in my Mustang somewhere, kissing like there was no tomorrow. We had a lot of adventures and like I said, they were good times, the best times of my life so far. Three years ago, we decided to try skiing. When we got there, all the kids were learning to snowboard, not ski. We decided to learn how to snowboard too. This was the beginning of the end. Mom started an affair with your ski instructor, didn't she? Dave asked angrily. So much for her promise, damn it. Can I please tell the damn story? It's almost finished, I said. Sam stood up and sat on my lap. I continued talking. So, to answer your question, your mom did not have an affair with her ski instructor or anyone else during our ski trip. That trip, right up until the end, was one of the happiest memories of our marriage. Imagine spending all day with the person you love the most and have loved since you were old enough to even know what love is. You wake up with her in your arms. You exchange a few long, slow kisses. Then you flick her butt and go to breakfast. You hit the slopes and take a ski lesson. The air is crystal clear and smells fresh. Every time you look at her, 
your heart melts because you love her so much. You have lunch together, then go back to your room and make very passionate love until late afternoon. Then prepare for one last descent before dinner. I have to imagine it over and over again because it only happened like this on the last day. The rest of the time we were there, we fought constantly because your mom complained about everything all the time. According to her, the chalet was too warm. It was too cold outside. The sun was too bright and the night was too dark. The hills were too high and too long. The snow was too white. People were insincere. They were also too young. I think your mom has had to come to terms with the fact that she's almost 60 and not a sex symbol anymore. Anyway, the last day was perfect. It made all the previous days of arguing and complaining worth going through. We went for one last descent before dinner, and that's when it happened. Your mom wasn't a great skier, so she ended up picking up skis. As we walked up the hill, we noticed they were filming scenes for a commercial or announcement. Your mom has gone crazy. She continued to roll through the area they were photographing. They didn't seem to notice her. They would Lee was too focused on shooting the models they brought. So your mom, who, again, wasn't a very good skier, started trying to do tricks. She wasn't paying attention at all to where she was going and ended up sliding into the entrance to one of the pro tracks. Damn, our ski instructor didn't even ski on these slopes. One second, your mom was posing and making lip lines in front of cameras that weren't even pointed at her, and the next second she was screaming as she crashed into a tree. It was scary. There was one long scream and then a huge crash. She hit the tree so hard that it even shook. The rescue service was afraid to move her. They immediately called an ambulance and a med evac helicopter arrived and took her straight to the nearest hospital. Luckily, we were in Michigan, where there were many first-class medical facilities nearby. Heidi came to her senses three days later. This was good because during those three days she went through four surgeries. The first surgery was to repair her broken nose. The operation went well and brought Heidi out of danger of losing her life. The next day, they operated on her spine. Heidi had several discs that had slipped and were pressing on her spinal cord. If this continued for too long, she could lose the ability to move or control her limbs. This operation took the longest. Doctors were confident that she would regain the ability to walk as soon as she healed. The next day's operations were less serious. They had to put a pin in each of her wrists because she broke both, trying to protect herself from the blow. Other than a lot of bruises all over her face and body, Heidi was fine. As I said, Heidi came to her senses within three days. It seemed that all her mental faculties remained intact. And maybe if I had been smarter, I would have learned something from this experience. Sarah, do you remember when I fell down the stairs that year when we were putting up Christmas decorations together? Of course, Dad. It was so scary, she said. What was the first thing I said when I came to my senses? I asked. You asked the guy from the ambulance about Mom and us. Sarah said. Well, I sat there for three days straight. I never left your mother's side for a minute. Her first words after the thoughts were, damn, followed by, what do I look like? At that time, I was so glad that she, I woke up and said that perhaps this moment had passed me by. It took several months before I was able to realize all this. The hospital where Heidi was hospitalized was 80 miles from our home. I went there every day. I was there in the hospital every day for four months straight, when Heidi was able to leave the hospital. They suggested that some treatments and critical things needed to be monitored and could not be done at home. They suggested a nursing home or intensive care facility. There were several such places in our area. One of them was only 10 miles from our house. Heidi insisted on going to the one near East Lansing. It was almost 90 miles from our home. I didn't understand why she wanted to go there. I thought that maybe since Sarah was back in college, she wanted to be closer to Sarah. Maybe this way, with my contract job, if I had to work, Sarah would be there. Also, Justin, Sarah's new boyfriend, worked there. I would go there every day and spend the entire day and then return home when visiting hours ended. Heidi was supposed to be there for a month. The first three weeks were uneventful for me, but that was because I was stupid. I remember this day like it was yesterday. I arrived there earlier than usual. The traffic on the 696 was lighter than usual, so I hit the gas and my baby Mustang shot forward. 
I usually arrived right after they wheeled Heidi out of her room in her wheelchair and let her shower. Heidi regained her ability to walk, but she was still a little unsteady on her feet. Therefore, for safety reasons, she was transported in a wheelchair. They probably wanted her to get out of the hospital before she fell and got hurt. Typically, after her morning shower, she would be returned to the breakfast room for one or two rounds of tests, and then visiting hours would begin. I usually arrived around 9 a.m., so my arrival at 8 a.m. was a surprise. In fact, Heidi wasn't even in the room when the guards let me inside. I decided to surprise her, but I was surprised. I hid in the small bathroom in Heidi's room. You must understand that this was perhaps the happiest time of our marriage. We got along better than ever. Even when I was in the hospital with her, we planned things we wanted to do together and places we wanted to go for the first time in my life. I was sure that Heidi loved me as much as I had always loved her. I may have had to wait until we were 50, but I ended up winning. I won the woman of my dreams. It may have been almost 40 years after we met, but in the end I won. So I had to hold back my laughter when some guy wheeled her chair into the room and helped her back into bed. However, he did not roll out the chair but close the door. And he did it as if he did it regularly. He came back to Heidi's bed just as I was about to go over there and surprise her. They started having sex. They both had to try to be quiet so the nurses wouldn't hear them. I thought about leaving the toilet while they weren't paying attention, but I was shocked. It was then, lost in my thoughts, that I realized that your mother would never be the woman I wanted her to be. My kids are grown now, so I had no reason to put up with it anymore. The guy took Heidi back to the shower so she could clean herself up again and I just left. I left and went home. Heidi started calling me almost as soon as I left the building, but I didn't answer her calls. As far as I was concerned, the marriage was over. I did everything the same day. I contacted my lawyer to get the ball rolling. I withdrew most of the money from all my accounts. I left her a couple thousand dollars, but nothing more. I made an agreement with the realtor for a very quick home sale. Real estate values in our area were very high, and I got a great price from a real estate broker. He offered $411,000 for the house. I agreed. I rented a large condo, a truck, and a trailer. I packed all my stuff into the truck and put my Mustang on the trailer. I changed my iPhone number and left. I wrote three letters to the three of you and included them in the divorce papers. You guys were scattered all over the place, and I knew you would contact me as soon as you received your letters. I included my lawyer's contact information in the emails and asked him to give you my new number as soon as you asked for it. So Heidi couldn't reach me, but you all could. I never expected that Heidi would steal money from her children or that she would not give you my letters. Every day I drove as far as I could, stopping for a while in each state to get a feel for the people there and around. I think I was so frustrated that I just drove until I ran out of land. I decided, I'm staying in Florida. There's a thriving Michigan snowbird community there, and the Tigers even hold spring training there. I didn't socialize or do anything for the first year. Realizing that Heidi wasn't going to give me a divorce, I filed for it. Florida. I also started my own small turnkey property management business. We take care of properties for people who live elsewhere most of the year. So if they live in Michigan or Ohio and they need a way to cut their grass or their house is ready for hurricane or anything like that, we can handle it. After my first year, I started going to bars and clubs. I wasn't ready to date yet, but there were plenty of women my age or close to it who hinted that they were interested. I met a couple of women who were like your mother. They turned my stomach out. Most women our age are a little stocky. I knew I was tired of flying economy class. For me, there are no more women with flat chests and flat asses. That's why I was in clubs. I took inventory of the types of women that were available. I met Sam there, in one of the clubs. But that's a different story. James, you should never have found out about this, Heidi cried. It was just... It was just you breaking another promise to me and showing how little I mean to you, Heidi, I said. But I called you again and again that day. I thought something happened to you. Something happened to me, I said. I'm tired of the way you treated me. But James, it didn't mean anything, Heidi cried. Don't you realize that after all this time you're the only man I've ever loved? 
If this is what you call love, then I don't need it, I said. For the first time in my life, I have someone who really loves me. I'm better off without you, Heidi, and I have my children again and another son on the way. I knew something had happened that day, Heidi said. The nurse told me she saw you. She said you went upstairs. Justin turned white. What does Justin have to do with this, Dad? Asked Sarah. That was him in the room with your mom, I said. Then the commotion began. Sarah tried to get to Justin, who tried to get up and run away. David grabbed him and hit him. I tripped Justin and he fell right in front of Sarah. Justin was finally able to break free and ran away from the house. Kelly and I consoled Sarah for about an hour while everyone else talked downstairs. After Kelly gave her a couple of sleeping pills to calm her down, Sarah fell asleep. She's seeing a lawyer tomorrow to file for divorce, Kelly said as she returned to sit with the others. We sat in awkward silence for a while before Heidi spoke. James, I've been thinking a lot in the last three years that you've been away. Tomorrow I'm going to the hospital so they can diagnose what's wrong with me. I really wish you were here to help me with this. Mom, are you crazy? asked David. She's definitely not herself, Sasha said. I want my money now. Write me a check so I can cut you out of my life, or I'll have you arrested before you get to the hospital. Heidi, you're my husband's mother, Kelly said. But you abused our hospitality. All this time we put our lives on hold, when you had more than enough money to take care of yourself. We accepted you and... No, Kelly, I said. She took advantage of you. Heidi is that type of person who is always there when she needs it. She uses people. That's all she can do. You guys realized this much earlier than I did. At least we're all together again. You can call me anytime you need. Why don't you all come to Florida for Christmas? I looked at my watch and realized that it was time for us to leave. We'll do it, Dad, David said. Come on, Mom. I'll help you get ready. James, you can't be serious. How can you fly away with this child when I need you? Because this child loves him and is faithful to him, Grandma, Sam said angrily. I handed Sam her coat and she began to put it on. She leaned over and kissed me. James, you won't leave me, Heidi screamed. It will torment you. You have always forgiven me, and this time too, you belong to me. No, Sam said, stopping in front of Heidi. Now he belongs to me. I wish you a super brilliant day. Fuck you, Heidi blurted out angrily. We made it to the airport with about 20 minutes to spare. The little V6 Vert drove through the snow, but we made it to the airport in one piece and flew home to Florida. David, Kelly, Sarah, and Sasha actually came to Florida for Christmas. They had a great time and spoiled Sam, whose belly was already noticeably rounder. Sarah ended up staying. It was great to have her here while she tried to get her life back together after her divorce from Justin. Heidi seemed to call them almost every day, but none of them picked up. Finally, one day she just stopped calling. A few weeks later, my lawyer called me to a meeting. Heidi and I had wills before I left her and she never seemed to update them. Heidi died in hospital. She died alone. Even on the day of her death, doctors were still trying to diagnose the mysterious disease that had afflicted her. They think it could be similar to the birth defect that took her mother at the same age. I divided the money equally between my children. The last thing left to do was to bury Heidi. While it was raining, many people left. There are surprisingly few people left here. Big surprise that Justin is here. We all think he just wants to try to make peace with Sarah. As the rain got heavier, the priest called me and told me that we needed to hurry because of the weather. I told him that we would each throw a handful of earth on the coffin and leave from here. We all gathered at David and Kelly's house after that. I think I came out at the right time to meet the woman who will make me happy for the rest of my life. So, at least for me, that makes this world perfect. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think about listening to the next one.